Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the third in our series of keynotes as part of the Illinois State Board of Education's CTE Summer Speaker Series. The theme for this series is CTE for all students and for each student. And we are particularly trying to unpack um, issues and obstacles around supporting all students, including what the Perkins Five Act, uh, students who the Perkins Five Act uh, considers special populations, as well as students who would be pursuing non-traditional careers. Um, but we want to really connect both theory and practice in this series. And again, this series will pick up again in late July uh, with our educator panels. So with that, today we're very excited. Uh, we've had other keynote presenters from other places in the United States. Today we're coming to you locally with um, again, we've had uh, a professional organization, someone from a, a State Department of Education outside of Illinois, and now we have someone who um, both has her, her own organization as well as works for a post-secondary institution. And so we're really excited to have Dr. Ayanna Brown. Uh, we're going to turn it over to Dr. Brown and let her introduce herself. And we're excited to have you. Again, if you can quickly fill in the sign-in form if you haven't already done so, if you're joining us, that's great. If you're watching this later on YouTube, we're thrilled to have you and to engage you in the conversation as part of the Illinois State Board of Education's career and technical education ongoing improvement work. Dr. Brown, thanks so much for being here. We're all yours. Good morning. Thank you so much and uh, welcome everyone. Um, I appreciate your time. You could be doing a host of things today. Um, and the, the fact that you chose to spend your time with us is greatly appreciated. And uh, we look forward to adding to your experiences and knowledge base and sharing with you. So um, there's, I guess there's a couple of housekeeping details in terms of the chat. It is open and it's absolutely available to you. We would love for your comments, questions, thoughts, and we'll have various stopping points during our time uh, to ensure that uh, we are managing that. So for my team who's behind the scenes and making uh, this day magnificent in advance, thank you very much. Um, we, we are still a part of, of humanity, despite the fact that we're on Zoom. So we're going to forgive technical errors in advance uh, <laughs> and, and assume that uh, technology doesn't, doesn't resolve all things. So just in case we do have a snafu, um, don't, don't run away from us. You know, uh, that's sort of part of the process. So I'm going to share my screen as a means to get started, uh, which will include my my formal you know introductions if you will um and uh again i'm going to minimize um all of my friends that are in the corner there and so if there is indeed a stopping point uh for our chat time i will be more than honored if our team members would just give me a whistle or you know say something and let me know that we need to to pause for a moment so our time today um, is, is going to focus on engaging in community responsibility for the learner and learning, the 21st century demand for post-secondary education. My name is Ayana F. Brown. I am an associate professor of education and cultural studies at Elmhurst University, which is locally right here in uh, Elmhurst, Illinois. However, I am also the founder and chief thought leader for Thought Spectrum, LLC. And uh, I have been honored to, to have a host of experiences uh, over many years doing professional development and supporting uh, the learning context. And I say that because a lot of times when we think about education and professional development, we sort of locate that with teachers and, and, um, and working with them in terms of instruction. And when we think about um, professional development and supporting learner and learning, then we also have to broaden that a bit to think about all of the constituent groups that are a part of that. That includes community, that includes the social, the cultural, um, varying spaces that all interface with the learner. And so our time, um, while my charge initially began with thinking about the needs for post-secondary education, the value and the importance of post-secondary education, um, it's important for me that as we do this work, we have to create sort of an ecological model 
of thinking about post-secondary education to include community, society, and all the things that interface with what it means to learn. So as we talk today, um, you're going to hear me engage in discussions of how do we see the learner in the context of society, not just solely the learner in the context of the classroom or strategies for teaching or um, what I'm gonna call quick fixes to how do we help parents become involved. Um, and this is important because when we think about the learner, we have to broaden the umbrella because sometimes the learner is the parent. And so when we talk about parent involvement and the learner is 40, you're not gonna call their 72 year old parent to engage the 40 year old learner. So we have to think about what the learner needs and who the learner is in order to be more effective in engaging the demand and the responsibility and the need. So um, thank you for jumping on this journey with me. And I hope that if there is additional information that you require, resources or support, you can place those questions in the chat and I'll absolutely leave you with my contact information uh, for future correspondences and, and we will proceed from there. So without further ado, um, let's talk about engaging in community responsibility for the learner and learning the 21st century demand for post-secondary mm -hmm. education. So I want to start with my thank you. <laughs> thank you so much to Northern Illinois University and the Center for P20 Engagement. Um, obviously, you, there's a host of partnerships that are a part of making this happen, and there's a whole team of people who are involved. And so I'm naming Jason Klein and Debbie Kerman up front, but I certainly recognize that they are not the only ones. So thank you so much, Bill Rose, Rodrigo Lopez, um, for all of your support and what you're offering today in order to make this event happen, and for, for all of those of you who are equally involved involved as well. So um, this is going to have small bits of interaction. Um, we are an intimate group and we won't exhaust that, but we do want to hear your voices. I know that we have a few people that are joining us today. Um, if you don't mind, um, if we can enable their uh, mics to be disabled so that our uh, participants can um, share with us who you are. And I'd like for you to read this title and think about what it means to you. Engaging in community responsibility for the learner and learning. The 21st century demand for post-secondary education. So there's no rubric involved, so just don't feel as if you have to hit all the boxes, but introduce yourself and then offer a small thought about what you think this means for you and the context in which you work. Is there anyone who would like to, to share? I can go. I'm Cassie Blickham. I'm the director at Valley Education for Employment System. And this engaging in community responsibility for the learner and learning, um, my first thought is work-based learning and the responsibility we ask our community to have for the learner while they're physically on site at the work-based learning site and the learning that goes on in work-based learning. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Cassie, and welcome. Thank, thank you. That was an important uh, way of thinking that it's when you're physically there and then when you depart, because, you know, we like to say learning's dynamic, we're lifelong learners. And so that doesn't limit us to the spatial location for where we think the learning is being delivered. So thank you so much. Anyone else would like to share? Good morning. I can go next. Um, I'm Amy Treadwell, and I'm uh, the um, director of uh, programming at Schools That Can, uh, which is a post-secondary program that works with high schools to support um, soft skills and uh, communication skills for high schoolers. And so when I think of engaging community responsibility, the learner and learning, I think of the parents, and I think about the um, what parents often uh, assume is the only pathway to success and how we can support parents in broadening their understanding around um, uh, careers and what's possible for their students. 
Thank you so much. Um, thank you very much, Amy. And uh, I, I think, you know, when we think about this responsibility to the learner and learning, that sort of embracing family, because they are also learning as well. I can think of many circumstances where in teaching, particularly in Zoom land, um, I've had parents pull up a chair and sit down alongside their student. And they went to school that day also. Um, sometimes the intention for why they pulled up a chair, we don't know, but when we embrace the model, when we're disseminating information and then engaging in dialogue and building an interactive space with a learner, um, particularly where the walls of the classroom came tumbling down in COVID, then we invite it to the table, people who became teachers who weren't necessarily uh, prepared to be teachers or who thought they were the teacher, um, learners who became co-learners or co-adaptive learners where older siblings are helping their younger siblings log in, grandparents are monitoring whether or not students submitted their work on time. Um, the, the, the idea of who's a part of the conversation absolutely shifted. And if we think about um, that as a perfect storm, we don't like the tragedy of what COVID brought to us and having to do it, but what did we learn about community? What did we learn about the context for building relationships with the learner and learning because of a situation um, that is rooted in what I will call um, a medical, scientific, environmental, social, emotional traumas of sort. So uh, thank you for, for offering that, that the, the, the family base then becomes a part of having to think differently, but also being invited to the table around what it means to think about uh, the possibilities for their learner and learning. Thank you very much for that. Is there anyone else who'd like to share? Um, this is Jason. I'll jump in real quickly awesome. in that. Um, first of all, Michelle has has jumped in. She's the EFE director in Iroquois County, and she's in a real loud environment right now, so she's not going to unmute herself. We've had that shared in the chat, but thank you, Michelle. Um, second of all, I want to jump in and say, you know, it's really interesting. One of the plays, I, places, excuse me, I think we've um, historically seen learning benefit from a strong level of community responsibility has been related to, to co-curricular activities. And the more self-contained the community is, the even stronger that level of community responsibility has been for those activities. And, and you certainly see it with sports, but it's not exclusive to sports. You see it with uh, music, you see it with clubs, um, including a number of the, um, the, the student career and technical student organizations. And so I think that's really important. And I think one of the things, and, and Cassie certainly kicked us off with this, with the mention of work-based learning is across that whole continuum of work-based learning, um, helping the community have that level of responsibility for all kinds of learning um, throughout the school experience, I think is, is really important. And, you know, we sit here having this conversation today on an election day, when there are a handful of of referenda for school districts that are, are open around the state. And um, that is certainly one way the community bears responsibility, but um, obviously the direct connection with students is another very significant way, so. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for that contribution, uh, Jason. And, and we have to remember that when schools in the, in the, I won't go down my whole rabbit hole on the sociocultural context and history of American education, but <laughs> can't help it. Um, when we think about the inception of, of this idea of public education, and what does it mean to try to embrace and build a sense of community? The school became the rallying point, the local space by which the community gathered. And so when the school also becomes the voting uh, location, when the school becomes the American Red Cross setup shop, if there's a disaster in the neighborhood, when the school becomes the place where there's food distribution, even when students are not at school, Right, but it becomes the location site to ensure that children are receiving their breakfast or lunch um, during those periods of time. So the physical building itself becomes symbolic 
of what it means to create and embrace community. And the more um, we we think about those, what, what we'll call a more centralized location, or in some cases, more isolated location, locations, the more dependent community becomes um, upon the school building as a location space. And more profoundly, the more we engage with the learner and learning in schools without walls, when we think about the learner and learning with online learning, then we have to think about how do we build community then? If I can log in to um, a website, if I can log in to a digital platform, and this is where I'm going to engage in my learning, I'm still a learner, but who is my community? And so we have to begin thinking about the needs of the learner, and, and we saw this with the social and emotional challenges that came for students with online learning, while we, we made it happen, and, and many places have been doing it for years pre-COVID, you know, COVID didn't create online learning communities. However, what we do find is that there is a need for relationship. And so when children who are in the pre-K through eight life span of education, when they are disassociated from community, there are consequences for that. But we also can't assume that because students are older, meaning secondary nine through 12 and post-secondary, which is absolutely what we saw in the collegiate space, we can't assume that just because those students are older that they don't desire or need community. They don't need to feel connected. They don't need to feel accountable, they do. And sometimes those connect, those points of connection, those, those access points to community is what helps those learners understand their role and how to advance community and then society. So when we think about engaging community responsibility, it seems like it might be temporal for the learner, but really we're modeling for the learner who they will be and how they will participate as community for the next set of learners. So it really does become a cyclical uh, relationship. So the nuance to this language is post-secondary because if we think about the demand for the learner and learning, it's for life, not necessarily limited to a degree holding or certificated spaces. We want people to see their relationship to learning as a part of a larger community and what that means. So here's a small example, and then and we've only done two slides, folks, and, and we're just... <laughs> uh, so here's an example. We think about our, 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 um, our seniors and our, our, our loved ones who engage in learning because they want to. They've completed formal education. They, they may have or may have not had access to education. They have worked careers. They've participated in economic earning spaces. And they're at a season of life where they are no longer required if they have that privilege to not necessarily work. They are in the season of their life. Some people refer to it as their golden years, but they are at a point where they have the privilege because they have contributed to society in during a time during many many years of of their um, of their lives. And yet, when you go to voting polls, overwhelmingly the people who volunteer, when you go and look at volunteerism, you will find those same people who are in a season of their life where they can relax, oftentimes carrying the heaviest weight in terms of volunteerism and civic responsibility. Which means in order to be that volunteer poll worker, in order, since you talked about the elections today, in order to be the persons who are assisting at the Red Cross, there were people who volunteered for COVID relief, who participated in phone banks, you found that many people still had the vigor, they had the vitality, they had the sense of care. They had the belief in uh, the necessity to help in some capacity. And so the learner is without the walls or the borders of the school within and of itself. Um, we're gonna move forward because we're gonna talk about a lot today. Um, and again, just to remind you all that if there is a comment or a thought in the chat, you know, um, team awesome back there, let me know <laughs> what's, what's happening. All right. so. 
foundational context and consideration that, that I've, I've just mentioned. We're gonna really be thoughtful about who are the learners. We're gonna think about what are their learning demands or needs. We're also gonna think is who's responsible. Who's responsible for the, the learning demands and the needs. So the context and consideration we have to have is, is going to challenge us to think with contextualized specifics. Because if we say, who are the learners and, this, and, the, and the learner is 18 years old, that may be different than who's the learner if they're 25. That may be different if the learner is a third career at the age of 40, right? The learning demands and needs, what's involved in that, and this sense of accountability. I say responsibility, but if we think about it as accountability, then there's a different kind of uh, skin in the game, if you will, as, as we suss that out. So um, who am I? I gave you the introduction to who I was. My name is Ayana F. Brown. I'm an associate professor in education. You know, but in the end, I'm grandma's baby, right? So this is, this is my grandmother. I, I think I might have been maybe six weeks old here in this photo. Um, and what does it mean in a, in a very maternal, grandmotherly sort of way to, to feel responsible? right, to feel the sense of accountability in those very early moments of, of life, right, for, for a, a, an infant, right? Here I am at four, you know, dancing around in, in my parents' living room. You see the albums in the corner, it dates me, right? You know, <laughs> there's no MP4 down there. That's a straight up album <laughs> from a 78 probably from back in the day, right? Um, but who am I? I'm, I'm born of believers and survivors. This is my great, 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 great grandmother who was an ex-slave, who was also a sharecropper. Now, if you notice in this picture, you see a bit of color. She was the oldest living person that I can record that, that uh, in our family. She died at the age of 111 in Alabama. So if I think about who I am and, and being born of believers and survivors, I have to contextualize that she did not have access to formal education. But uh, you can't tell here but in this picture, there's a pot belly stove that's, that's right here in this left-hand corner, right? But what you can't tell is that this wallpaper are newspapers. And so literacy and words literally flank the walls as tools um, in order to help provide a sense of access. Uh, there's a calendar, there's a poster that's over here. And um, again, what always strikes me when I return to this photo is that while this is, uh, I believe, 1976, right? You have a color photo that features a woman who lived through the invention of the camera, <laughs> right? <laughs> the invention of, you know. Um, Dr. Is, Brown, Dr. Yeah. Brown, can I interrupt real quickly? Would you would you be willing to share her name? Mary. Thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll Mary. More. Um, so here is her home. Um, this is where she lives, uh, lived, and um, we'll learn a little bit more about her. So, sorry. So when I think about who I am as a learner, here's me literally sitting next to what I'm gonna call my ancestor, right? And while I don't remember literally when we took this photo, I know that I'm about three, four years old. This is my mom with the bottle nose glasses there, very, very vogue in the 70s. You can tell that it's like the, that 70s show auditions happening here with my sister Lisa in this outfit and my sister Lorraine, right? This is Mary on her porch. Oops. 
I haven't been into the office and my mouse is just, you know, having a field day here, right? Um, this isn't something I have to open up an old history book and, and look at a photo of an image of a person I'm not connected to, right? This is very present. And for my sister, if I'm four, my sister Lorraine is six years older than me. She's 10 years old. Who can remember when we went to Oroville, Alabama to see great, 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 great grandma Mary, right? Um, these are my grandparents. Okay, on my mother's side, both of them, their first name is both Willie. <laughs> this is Willie May. This is Willie James, right? Married, had my mother. And their role and growth in this life includes meeting in a strawberry patch, picking strawberries, right? Um, and, and moving from Alabama to Niagara Falls, New York. The Great Migration is our journey from Alabama to um, Buffalo, New York, which is where I was born. But my grandparents went on both sides of my family. My father's grandparents were from um, the Oroville, Alabama area and moved to Buffalo, New York. My mother's side of the family, Georgiana, Alabama to Niagara Falls, New York. That's a part of a larger narrative of them moving as far to Buffalo, to Niagara Falls, to an uh, hour from Canada. So there's a narrative there that I don't have to read in a history book to connect to. Now, within all that, there's this thing called work and labor of how do you get there and why are you leaving? So when I think about my career and my journey and what it means for me, as a beneficiary of Mary's labor, I have to situate that socio-historical context to be Dr. Ayanna Brown in the idea that someone worked a field and survived it enough for me to be me and who I am. Now, our learners all have journeys. They all have stories. There is a narrative by which they have arrived at this moment that they have made whatever educational choice they have. Every story isn't rooted in the same thing, but there is indeed a story. And part of the process for engaging the context and the demands for the learner is in inviting them to know what the journey is. Because when we establish potentially a social and community context for learning, we are helping invite people in a sense of purpose. There were absolutely many days at Vanderbilt University where I walked around campus, probably absolutely feeling a bit defeated as a doctoral student. And I had to walk among that space thinking about how my journey was absolutely difficult, but it certainly wasn't Mary's, right? So as we engage in thinking about the context for learning and the learning, the demands become different as time progresses and the issues become different, okay? So I'd like to pause briefly to invite our participants to reflect on your narrative. What is your journey into the context of learning? What is your story and how has the decisions you've made to be effectively engaged in the work that you do, inclusive of a journey that supports a purpose for learning. So I'd like to give you just a moment um, for that thought. And if you would like to share that thought, I invite you to do so. Jason, can we take that moment? Absolutely. Is there anyone who would like to share? Well, since you started with your grandparents or great, great, great grandparents, I thought of my grandparents also. Um, my father's father didn't finish high school. He signed up for World War II at the age of 16 by forging his mother's signature on his 
enlistment card. And my mother's parents both went to school um, speaking a language other than English because they were recent immigrants. So I thought of both of those things um, as you shared your family pictures and history. Thank you, Cassie. Is there anyone else? So to oh, sorry, Bill. Oh, go ahead. Um, thanks. So yesterday I was actually thinking about this because my grandmother, when I went off to college or was, you know, just enrolling, um, she shared with me that she had bought the books, enrolled in classes and was going to nursing school and then ended up not going and no one followed up with her and no one cared um, to do that. And she, you know, told me about how important it was for me to continue no matter what journey I went on, but to continue to push myself, whether others didn't believe in me, whether anyone was holding my hand through it, it was my responsibility to continue this journey that she never got to take. Yeah, and, and that can be very supportive or it can create a tremendous amount of pressure, right? <laughs> <laughs> it absolutely can go both ways, you know, <laughs> understandably. So thank you so much, Amy, for sharing that. Anyone else? Jason, were you jumping in there or anyone else? Bill, you want to go ahead? Yeah, so I was going to share um, uh, the experience in my family was uh, that my parents uh, did not finish college. And um, most of my grandparents didn't. I had one grandparent uh, who had a degree in biology, but uh, very similar to the experience that because they didn't get to finish, um, the expectation was that we we did. And so um, I'm one of seven uh, uh, young people in my family and all of us have degrees. So uh, it's kind of nice to have that expectation there and, and make it to that point. Yeah. It's, it's always interesting when you attend, I, I thought about, you know, I, w when will I do like an ethnography of graduation? And, and when you watch and observe graduations, how frequently you see or hear, you know, the expressions of grandparents and, and parents, you know, you, you did this for the family or, the, or the, the graduate articulating like this is for my, you know, other person who encouraged me. This was, I, I give this I did this on behalf of, you know, that sense of this isn't just for me, it's the community, right? We hear lots of language around the sacrifices of parents to ensure that their kids were able to, you know, and, and, and that maybe I, maybe I will do that study, that ethnography of graduation, because it's there. Jason, it looks like you had a wonderful thought. No, okay. <laughs> you might. <laughs> All right, so let's just, so I, I think, I think we've, we've sort of, you know, made the point um, in terms of this relational. So in order to situate this idea, I'm gonna minimize my little screen there. Okay, in order to, to situate how we're going to engage in the learner in learning, I'm gonna use a theoretical framework that is multifaceted and I'm gonna move us through time just a little bit um, in order to do this. So the theoretical framework for today and how I want us to think about this is gonna be inclusive of the Tuskegee model, Booker T. Washington and the Tuskegee Institute, or what is Tuskegee University now. The work of Fannie Lou, Lou Hamer and this idea around food, um, empowerment, and, and, and the and and the absence of information are all the other issues that are involved in, in this understanding. Then I want to lean into the work of Dr. Jerome Morris, who's a professor at the University of Missouri St. Louis on communally bonded schools. And, and then finally, the work of democratic possibilities with Dr. Patricia Hill Collins, um, who you would know um, in terms of her research in, in Black feminist theory um, and, and the politics, the social politics of education across uh, race, class, and gender. So I want to first begin with um, the, the Tuskegee model. And for those of you who know the history of, of Tuskegee University or uh, Tuskegee uh, University is in Tuskegee, Alabama. Tuskegee is about uh, 25 minutes um, from uh, Montgomery, Alabama. 
It's also about an hour and 45 minutes if you're a college student <laughs> driving from Atlanta. Um, it is the heart of the, many people would argue as the black belt, uh, which we will talk about and describe a little bit more. Tuskegee uh, Institute uh, or Tuskegee Normal and Agricultural Institute as it began in its inception, invited learners into learning in a context where while they were free in a uh, antebellum sense, access to education was not truly available to them in a way that engaged their funds of knowledge. So when I use the phrase funds of knowledge, I'm talking about what does it mean to have a population of Black people in the South who literally build the nation and the agricultural and industrial industry, but they are never able to go to school and have formal education. So what does it mean for a community of people to go to school and have access to school, but they've already been doing the work? They've already been engaging in the labor um, of, of what it means to understand irrigation and agriculture and planting seasons and building and scaffolding and brick making. They already know how to do this because it literally is the life that they were living by force. So what does what does school mean then? And it's in this context that Booker T. Washington, um, as a student at Hampton Institute in Hampton, Virginia, is called upon by General Armstrong to start or build a school in Tuskegee that had been uh, a land grant by the state of Alabama um, with there's land, but there's literally nothing there charged with the task of, of building a school. So in reading the autobiography of Booker T. Washington, which is called Up From Slavery, what you learn is that there's this social context and educational environment where learning and the learner have to be paired together, but it has to be done in the context of what does it mean for it to be the 1800s in Alabama, less than 20 years removed from emancipation and not yet be at the turn of the century. What does it mean in a social, political, economic context to have a community of learners? Similarly, we have a capital D here, that's for a reason, of disrupting the legacy of poverty for uneducated and marginalized people. And so Washington is working within a socio-political context where he is charged with creating access to private education, right? It's a land grant. The land was funded or, or seeded, if you will, by the state of Alabama, but the resources for the institution are private, it's private money, which means there is none, right? There's no bucket of money that's existing um, for uh, enslaved people or newly freed people for their education, but it's a private institution. So how do you disrupt this legacy of poverty for an uneducated and marginalized people when there's no bank account waiting for you? How do you build that? And that by far is the history of historically black colleges and universities. There are institutions and people who choose to cede that money, but ultimately it's not coming from the people in which um, they're desiring to serve because there are no resources and had never been any to prepare for them. And at the same time, this context that Washington uh, engages in is also an opposition to the de-skilling of adult learners. Washington's text and his socio-political approach to building Tuskegee is really in the opposition of de-skilling adults. And what do I mean by that? When we talk about what historically is called vocational education, was basically providing opportunities for people to be laborers and to continue as laborers in a skills-based environment with a wage. And in order to maintain a working force of laborers, there were some investments that were never made. 
And many people would argue that those investments were academic investments. They weren't necessarily being invited into, into the table on business management. They weren't being invited into the table of studying finance. They weren't being invited to the table on entrepreneurship. They were being invited to the table to labor, but they were being de-skilled as learners. And Washington adamantly opposed the culture of enslavement that led to an entire laboring force that de-skilled adult learners. So the story of Tuskegee uh, Normal School, which becomes Tuskegee Institute, which is now Tuskegee University, is that its first day of class is July 4th, 1881. And for many of us who celebrate the birthday of Mother Tuskegee, July 4th has a very different meaning because in this sense, it is an opposition to enslavement that says freedom for the laborer must begin on this particular day. And it was a conscious decision of Washington to choose July 4th as the first day of school for these newly freed and emancipated persons. So if you don't get the subtlety of the opposition to the start of school for black people who were slaves just, you know, 15 years ago, um, it's a symbolic gesture of doing that. These images uh, very much so uh, reflect Tuskegee's campus today. What you see here on the left um, is Tompkins Hall, which is the cafeteria. This Tompkins Hall is an example of one of the buildings that was made by students because there were no physical buildings when they got there. They had to begin classes in an old shanty church. And while they were in this church with his, with his initial students, one of the first things they had to do was build the buildings for them to actually go to school. So here you have brick making being the inception of career and technical education before it was even called that. So in order to go to school, we got to build the building and we're going to talk about how to do that. What you see on the right-hand side is White Hall. White Hall is, con I believe, if I get my history correct and my, my very good friends, um, my Tuskegee University docents, if you will, will correct me if I am wrong. Um, but White Hall, I believe, is the oldest building on Tuskegee University's campus to date. And it too is a dormitory now, but it too was also built by the students as many of the buildings uh, there. So when you think about what it means for the learner to engage learning, they also have to embrace the labor because while they are very much so freed, new, newly freed or early emancipated people, they're not escaping physical labor. If I want this, if my purpose for learning is, is being seeded by that sociopolitical context, I'm still working, right? But I'm now working for myself and working for the benefit of the goal that I'm seeking to accomplish. Now, Here's what's important when I think about engaging the learner and community context. When Washington gets to Tuskegee and he is attempting to find resources to build this school, he does not have a home. He's endowed with this responsibility by the state. He's given the charge and he's absolutely heralded in the community, but he's homeless. He doesn't have a place to live. But he's the principal who becomes the founding president, if you will, of Tuskegee. But he's homeless. So here's a quote from the text. I ate and slept with the people in their little cabins. I saw their farms, their schools, their churches. Since in the case of, of the most of these visits, um, there has been no notice given in advance that there's a stranger was ex um, that I was expected, excuse me, and I had the advantage of seeing the real everyday life of the people. He could not be the principal or the teacher and not be connected to the real life of his family, community members, or students. He continues, the students who came first seem to be fond of memorizing long and complicated rules and grammar and mathematics, but had little thought or knowledge of applying these rules to the everyday affairs of their life. Now, this is an important uh, context because the perception for his students was that in order to be a good learner 
or to be seen as a valuable learner, I need to know all the rules for grammar and mathematics. But there was no place to land that content knowledge. There was no real world application for it because their memorization was not paired with application or the opportunity. So when many people think about Tuskegee, they think about Washington's mission to take the funds of knowledge of what these people know and know how to do and offer them the academic context to make it make sense and for it to have viability so that they would have economic empowerment and stability. So one of the greatest scientists of American history who comes to Tuskegee at the behesting of Booker T. Washington is George Washington Carver. And in coming to Tuskegee, he's regarded as the poor people's scientist because as he engages in the study of botany and agriculture, he would ride around Macon County and neighboring counties in a wagon and he would explain to the farming communities how to work their land in order to create a different type of vitality for it in order to grow. So he became the science instructor for the community in learning without walls, right? So when we think about this social community context, while George Washington Carver was a teacher at Tuskegee, he doesn't limit his student base to the students enrolled in Tuskegee. He literally is moving about Alabama and working with the people because the community strength and the vitality of the community is what's going to provide and create the exchange for the survival of the institution and their students. So when we think about ingenuity to serve people, empower the people, and to change their condition, the investment in the learning and learning become really different. So here's an example. During the 1900s, Carver conducted extensive research and codified the use of crop rotation in combination with the, plant, the planting of nitrogen fixing legumes, sweet potatoes. He figured out that if you're only planting cotton, you're gonna deplete the resources and the, um, uh, the water base within the soil, it's dry, it's Alabama, it's hot. But when the season of cotton is over, if you rotate your crops with nutrient-rich plants, you're going to regenerate the biology and the soil biology of the land. So his system was known as regenerative agriculture, and it helped many Southern farmers away from the monocultural approach toward diversified horticultural operations. Now, if we put this in academic language today, and this very much so is in academic language today, but if you think about the, the weight of this academic language, I would probably argue that the science and the academic knowledge that goes with agricultural work was not considered valuable in a time where the people were not considered valuable. What we refer to as anti-Blackness today is very much so a part of the history that these people were not gonna be regarded as intellectuals. But in order to survive and regenerate and create a survival within the economic institution, they were very much so academicians because it was their academic understanding that came because of their skill and their experience that allowed them to cultivate an industry that we now um, discuss very differently when we talk about uh, farm to table, right? All the language that you see if you're in Whole Foods and you're walking around and it seems very hip and trendy. I'd like to say, how did my grandmother do it? Because there had not been a co-op of informants there was living and there was surviving that taught you how to make that make sense. How are we doing so far? Let me check in with our audience so far. Everybody okay? Awesome. I see there's a, let's pause for the chat. I don't know if there's anything we need to attend to. Uh, Team Awesome back there, is there anything that we need to attend to? <laughs> no, I've mostly been uh, throwing my thoughts out loud into the <laughs> chat so we can continue on. Wonderful. So if, if we move up a little bit from Washington and we think about the work of Fannie Lou Hamer. Now, for those of you 
who, you know, who did not benefit from a phenomenal history teacher. I'll say that. Um, and, and, and Fannie Lou Hamer wasn't discussed, mentioned, or put forward when we talk about uh, citizenship, citizenry, citizenry, voting rights, et cetera. Fannie Lou Hamer is someone you must know. And Fannie Lou Hamer spans time because in Mississippi, in the context of Mississippi, Fannie Lou Hamer is a sharecropper, right? One of many sharecroppers, born into a family of sharecropping, um, but finds herself at the center of the political st stage because of survival, right? And so um, I'm gonna let Fanny talk to you a little bit um, to help you understand what, how her emergence of understanding. And I want you to pay attention to the intersectionality, meaning the intersection, the relationship, the undisputable ability to disassociate them. You must keep them connected. I want you to associate and keep contextualized the relationship between labor and freedom. Okay, so here is Fannie Lou. Being one of 20 children, a very poor family, sharecroppers in the state of Mississippi, I know what it's like to be hungry. I know what it's like to be without clothes. I know what it's like to be without food. To live in a three-room house with no rock washroom facilities, just a three-room shack. So in my earliest childhood, I remember one day I was playing beside this road and the landowner drove up and he asked me, could I pick cotton? And I told him I didn't know, I didn't know. It's six years old, you know, I just didn't know. So he told us, I want you to go out in the field, Fanny, and I want you to pick 30 pounds of cotton. And if you pick 30 pounds of cotton in a week, I'll carry you to my commissary store and I'll let you get some of the things that you want to eat. So don't you like Cracker Jack? That was exciting because I'd never had to. I went out in the field and I told my parents. And my mother asked me that I want to try. And I told her I did. She told me, he said, now, we won't let you cheat. If you pick it, we'll say you pick it. But if you don't pick it, you don't get it. This made me work very hard. But that week, I did pick 30 pounds of cotton. That Saturday, the landowner did keep his promise. He carried me to this commissary store. He gave me some Cracker Jacks and cheese and the Daddy Wide Leg sardines. But I didn't realize what he was doing other than that. Because the next week, I was tasked 60 pounds of cotton. By the time I was 13 years old, I was picking two and 300 pounds of cotton. Mm -hmm. I am 17 years old. I picked 300 pounds of cotton a day. I am 9 years old. I helped my mother pick cotton. I picked 100 pounds a day. I was 13 years old. I helped my mother pick cotton. I picked about 200 a day. Now, at first, I, I really couldn't understand what it was that made us never have enough food. We worked all the time, but we never had enough to eat. We never had a chance to go to school. So my first reaction to my parent, especially to my mother, was to raise the question to her and ask her, how come we wasn't white? I begin with this portion with Fannie Lou Hamer to think about this relationship, this intersectionality between labor and freedom. Because in this piece, she makes a quick and almost abrupt dovetail from 
the labor and almost the um, the quick emergence into cotton picking, being cajoled, if you will, um, attracted to it because of a, because of food and this desire to have access to food. And so when we think about our our many people today, the invitation into going to work immediately and pursuing second post-secondary choices many times is of interest. I have a thing for, I like doing, I'm really creative. I have a set of um, interests in, but we also have to recognize that the attraction to skills-based career and technical careers for many people is because they're trying to feed a family. They're going to work or they're looking to gain skills or certifications or licensures because of a demand. And while we regard them as careers, we've elevated the discourse. We've created honor for the labor that goes with it. But in the root narrative, being cajoled into early workers is connected to a different type of system. So when we think about this, this intersectionality between labor and freedom, what Fanny is, is offering to us immediately is this idea that if I were white, I wouldn't be hungry because the shift is so abrupt. You almost don't expect that to be the conclusion, but she's a child. And all she sees is that I am participating in a backbreaking labor force, and all these children are, where they're engaging in work and labor with the expectations or similar expectations of adults. And ultimately the conclusion becomes, I wouldn't have to work this way if I were not white. Now, why do I offer this when we're trying to think about uh, this notion of, of career and technical education? Well, Hamer, Hamer's work shifts into an issue of food justice because if people have the ability to have access to resources and food and sustainability and not question their health or their wellness, the labor choices might be different if they don't have to negotiate whether or not I'm going to engage in this work. So here's some pieces that, that are important to know about Fannie Lou Hamer's work. In 1969, Hamer founded the Freedom Farm Cooperative on 40 acres of prime Delta land. When we talk about the Delta, we're talking about the Mississippi Delta. We're talking about land along the Mississippi River. And for those of us who are in Illinois, yes, the Mississippi is running right through us, right? So when we talk about the, the um, Delta land, we're talking about land that this river is absolutely feeding. And so the soil is rich. The agriculture is rich. And we have a million literary narratives. That's my former middle school English language arts teacher's background. There's a million stories that are out there that are connected to the Mississippi River, right? And what this means in terms of the voyage of moving in South. It's almost like talking about the Nile if we were in Egypt, right? Her goal with this prime land, with these 40 acres, her goal was to empower Black farmers and sharecroppers who had suffered at the mercy of white landowners. Well, how do you do this? If we think about who sharecroppers were, they are borrowing seed money, they are bor borrowing housing in order to plant crops so that they can harvest the crops, sell the crops, and then pay back the landowners what they borrowed, usually leaving them in poverty and only with enough food to survive winter if that, for them to go back and repeat the cycle again. They don't become economically emancipated. They become cyclically engaged in a condition of long-term poverty. And so Hamer in inserts this idea of, we have to empower Black farmers to disrupt poverty. So the co-op 
consisted of 1,500 families who planted cash crops. What did they do? When they cashed out, they purchased another 640 acres of land. Now think about that. With the money, they go buy more land. Why? Because we learned very early that land is your capital. And with this land, they started a pig bank where they distributed livestock to other black farmers. What do you do with the livestock? You breed it and you feed your family. So that way, the farm grew into a multifaceted self-help organization providing scholarships, home building assistance, and commercial kitchens, among other resources, so that they are moving out of the cycle of poverty. But how are they doing it? They're using the skills that they already have, right? Not that they wanted those skills, but the ones that they, they have to start with what they have, right? And what they had was this institution of enslavement, which leads to sharecropping, which leads to this, this cycle of poverty. Now, the next piece on the theoretical framework, and I'm putting all these pieces here for you, is that Patricia Hill Collins' work, and we very much so move quickly into the 20th century, is when Patricia Hill Collins talks about democratic possibilities. One of the arguments that she makes is that we need another kind of public education because the public education that we have do not engage in the possibilities in understanding the types of literacies that are going to be necessary to critically think. Fannie Lee Lou Hamer critically thought out how to create economic empowerment in a model that was intended to create deprivation and long-term poverty and labor. But she critically thought how to galvanize that. Patricia Hill Collins' argument is that the organization and the structure of public education continues to a certain degree, a cycle where if you don't have the critical thinking skills, and if you don't have the opportunities to think about school for what and school for whom, you are a part of a cycle that creates a rudimentary set of practice. It becomes standardization, it becomes worksheets, it becomes dummy down tasks that don't create opportunities for people to pursue what it means to not just survive, if I borrow from Bettina Love's work, not just to survive, but to thrive. And so as long as we have a, a segregated, economically segregated, a racially segregated system that we continue to see recycling, we've not created democratic possibilities. It's easy to see how it reproduces itself. So this is what Hill Collins says in her book, Another Kind of Public Education. Those of us who believe that democracy grows stronger when more voices are heard realize that centering our education on issues that matter to us sharpens our critical thinking skills. The better the public's ability to analyze social issues, the better equipped they become to act as first-class citizens. So my question is, what are the social issues that we need to be analytical about in the 21st century. Because if we are able to name and willingly, willfully and openly discuss, unpack and solve these social issues, we will sharpen our critical thinking skills that help us reinvest in the kind of education that our students deserve and so, so deeply need. So if I go back to Hamer, what was the social issue that she was able to analyze? She analyzed poverty. She analyzed hunger. And as a sharecropper with a minimal to no education, she builds a cooperative that seeds a cooperative economic plan to not just resolve the issue, but to oppose the de-skilling of farmers. How are we doing? Okay, thoughts, questions, comments. There should be moments, some of you should be going, oh my God, 
<laughs> the input. It's like, what is she doing? So if I were to pause here, what are some of the, the whirlwind of thoughts that are happening for you? So how do we think about these theoretical frameworks? I'm going to come back. I love awkward silence. So if you didn't get that there, you know, it's going to happen again. <laughs> Where am I going? Well, here we are with Dr. Jerome Morris, who talks about communally bonded schools. Now, just based on the title alone, when we talk about schooling as being communally bonded, what does that mean to you? It isn't schooling for graduation. It isn't schooling for licensure, schooling for certification, schooling for graduation day, right? Where we, we put on our regalia and we go do the thing. He said, we must create communally bonded schools. What does that mean? Well, communally bonded schooling views the relationship among schools, families, students, and communities as integral to students' academic success. Students' academic achievement and success cannot happen unless schools, families, students, and communities are working in relationship to one another. As long as they are disparate and functioning in isolation of one another, we are not working to the whole of children. Morris's work overwhelmingly examines desegregation, the impact of desegregation, and specifically with the overwhelming closings of Black schools. And what happens when with desegregation, you deplete the Black teaching workforce who could not be hired or get jobs in predominantly white schools? And so we see the numbers, and we talk about this with ISBE, this is the active conversation at the state level, of increasing the number of diverse teachers. Well, they were actually there, but with desegregation and the closing of black schools because of busing, right? So here comes one of those um, unintended consequences, right? Of what Derek Bell refers to as the entrance convergence of, of, of desegregation. With the closing of black schools, you now have black teachers who are no longer working in their own neighborhoods. So that sense of community, that sense of relationship is disbanded. So the call for um, communally bonded schools is to say there must be an intergenerational trust and a cultural bonding between educators and students. The more and more we have populations of teachers who drive to work 40 minutes, teach school and drive back home 40 minutes, they have no relationship to the communities in which their children live. They have very little relationship, not necessarily investment, right? Because you can still be invested even if you don't live there, but you're actively and deliberatively pursuing that investment. And so with an intergenerational trust, you're seeing age and rank, you're seeing relationships that are, that are built because of a trust of a relationship between educators and students. You're talking about the critical presence of Black educators, particularly when we continue to see 80% of our teaching force remaining to be white and female and overwhelming of representation of our students to be overwhelmingly over 90% in public education of students of color. So as long as you have this, what was referred to as this cultural discontinuity between who's in the classroom and who's, who's, uh, who's teaching and who's in the classroom, there becomes an intentionality of our teachers to really want to pursue a relationship. You don't have to look like the students you teach. That's not a requirement. But it is to recognize that if there is not a critical presence and a trust of bonding with your students, you're not gonna create a bonded relationship. Now, why is this important to know? One of the things that Gloria Ladson Billings talks about with culturally relevant pedagogy in, in her book, The Dream Keepers and all the seminal research that she's done is that many of her culturally relevant teachers that she researched, many of them were white. 
they didn't, they weren't necessarily black teachers, but they were invested in not trying to quote, save children, but they were invested in who the children were and developing their social, cultural, emotional, and economic identities. They were committed to what it meant to support and engage with a critical conscious understanding of empowerment and that they were equally learners from their students. And so when we talk about this critical presence of educators, it also includes for our administrators recognizing if you don't have representation in your faculty and in your staff that looks like the students you serve, you have to do twice as much work, if not more so, than discussing the discontinuities that will be present. And so, yes, there is the need for a critical presence of representation for the people that you are serving. Educators reach out to families and that's not parent teacher school night. That's not report card day. That's aside from that, it's relationship to uh, families and communities that are not inclusive of mandated nights. And, and quite frankly, as, as, a former edu as a former middle school teacher and then working at the high school and doing family community relationships work and as a scholarship coordinator, as a mom, as a professor, back to school night is pretty useless. It's 15 minutes and six of those minutes is where the teacher is talking to you. And you as the parents are not invited at all to inform, share, talk about the funds of knowledge, ways of thinking, hobbies, attitudes, perspectives, trigger buttons to get my kid really motivated, where the parent informs the teacher. It is usually one direction where the, the school is driving time and the organization of time. Now, similarly, as we, we think about uh, the, the educators reaching out to families. Similarly, in that parent-teacher conference context, you generally don't have the, the students involved in driving the conversation either. The learner isn't saying, hey, thank you so much, mom, dad, teacher. I wanna sit you all down together and tell you about my goals for the year. I wanna talk to you about what I'd like to accomplish. I wanna talk to you about my weaknesses, my fears. So when we think about shifting the narrative of what it means to develop an understanding of the needs for the learner, when does the learner become invited to lead the discussion on what they need as the learner? Now, I'm placing all these before you um, in order for you to think about within what become the demands for post-secondary, where we perceive that their chronological age shifts the demands that they may have as learners. So Morris's uh, model for communally bonded schooling looks like this. First, school is a pillar in the community. There is an interrelatedness of school, community, and family, where sometimes families are bringing the school out, okay? Community is, is, is being invited to create. The political, social, and economic forces and resources are not um, obscured, right? And there is the recognition that everyone's narrative with schooling isn't rooted in equity and equality. So understanding those structural forces that create a lack of trust between students and schools. So the artistry that exists when we think about cosmetology. This, this, some people would say career. Some people would say vocation or trade. Well, you know, for many years, one of the arguments that were had in cosmetology that it was, it was learning a profession or a skill set that had nothing to do with Black culture, had nothing to do with Black hair, right? So you go students who go to cosmetology school and you have the dolls that they work with the heads that they wash the hair on and they do all the stuff. And it doesn't model, reflect, texture, look like, it doesn't study, doesn't think about black women and black hair, right? Even the learning itself doesn't situate 
this other context and cult cultural ways of learning. When we think about building a community of learners, we have to be invited of going, what does this really mean then? Like, what are we really saying if we're trying to teach people about this industry of hair care? We actually have to have a discussion about hair care for whom? And these arguments have been made time and time again as we think about different forms of, of services that, that oftentimes occur, particularly when you're working with humans, right? When you're dealing with human services. Now, it's different than if you're working on a car, right? There, there's no cultural responsibility per se, right? It's a machine. But when you're talking about people, you know, there's a whole industry that's been built on hair care for Black women rooted in the idea that, generally speaking, they can't help me because they don't even understand me. And so this actually is, is, a, is a picture from, from uh, one of my resource texts that talked about during the transatlantic slave trade and not knowing if and how and when your children would be stolen. That you had grandmothers who would take grains and seeds and they would braid their children's hair and they would place the seeds into their hair. So whenever these kids landed, wherever they landed, they would be empowered to plant these seeds to never forget and also create access. And so many people talk about how the sweet potato, you know, really the yam, <laughs> right? Um, I invite you to watch um, the, uh, oh my gosh, and the documentary just went out of my head. If you know which one I'm talking about, uh, let me know the documentary on uh, African-American cooking and food and culinary arts and the culture of color. I'm going to remember it in a, in, a, in a moment. It just escaped my mind. That is a study of culinary skills and culinary arts that is not in the French cooking school, right? But it's very much so connected to identities and cultures of people. So if I synthesize, synthesize those theoretical frames, we have Tuskegee, we have Fannie Lou Hamer, we have Patricia Hill Collins with democratic possibilities, and we have this idea of communal bondedness, okay? I'm synthesizing these theoretical frames to say something. First, as we think about the learner and learning in the 21st century, we must understand the socio-political climate that our learners are in. Fannie Lou Hamer reminds us that we must awaken a sense of urgency and self-help that leads them to economic empowerment. Not the de-skilling, but the empowerment of economics, which means everybody ought to, ought to know finance. Everybody should be able to study and engage in understanding the economics of labor. It is very much so the Tuskegee model. There must be a catalyzation of learning within the critique of national rhetoric. We cannot invest and want an improved education and not invest in early child education, right? So we have to look at the national rhetoric and be prepared to critique it. Okay, it's very much so what James Baldwin argues in his talk to teachers in, in 1964. And we must establish centering relationships that disarm oppression while we invest in community. Well, how do we do it? You're probably saying, okay, now you've given us all this history. What are we doing here, Ayana? Well, what then are the demands for the 21st century learner? What are 21st century learners facing and what are we thinking about? Well, who is the 21st, 21st century learner? You can add to this list. This is my, my brain dump, right? The 21st century learner post-secondary they're learners ages ranging between 18 and 40, right? These learners are pursuing first and second careers. I would almost even dare say third, okay? Learners have families. And I don't necessarily always mean that they are parents. You have many learners who are siblings who are leaders in their families. So yes, they are parents, but sometimes they are still children who are functioning like the parental base. These learners are more digitally acculturated than you have ever been. Because for many of them, 
particularly the ones hovering in the 18 to 20 zone, their last 10 years of living have been completely coming of age as technology has morphed and evolved. However, when I think about when my mom decided to go back to school as a well over 60 year old woman, there was concepts with technology that she could not wrap her head around. She would go to class and she would write in shorthand in a steno pad, right? The, 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 the discourse of, of secretaries, if you will, right? It's, it's like reading beautiful Chinese script, right? And, and, and take all of her notes in shorthand because as a secretary, right? In the language of very much so the 1970s and 80s, right? Um, that's what she was skilled at doing. And then learning, so, okay, I'll type it up later when I get home, right? But being in class, doing script, okay? Almost look like Sanskrit. <laughs> Learners are not necessarily well-versed or confident with complex texts. Text. And this is an important point. As our students have grown with access to different tools and resources, we have found that the demands for teaching reading and content area literacies, that the demand has increased because there is an assumption that is made within content areas that because students can read narrative, that they can also read complex informational technical language text. And that is not true. And so as our access to literacies have increased, meaning different types of texts, so too has our demand for investing in teaching students how to read complexity. It's what happens when you have someone who loves novels and will happily read a novel, but when they pick up their chemistry book, they literally will get through a paragraph and go, I have no idea what it's talking about. This is not about if they can read. This is about how have they been trained to read complexity and technical language. It returns us to what we do in literacy work about vocabulary development. It scaffolded reading, and it's a demand for teachers to not make the assumption that because their students are post-secondary, that they have the literacies to read complicated informational technical text. And by far, that is the discourse of what we find in our technical careers, trades, vocation, training. Technical language that they must learn how to read. Well, our learners are multidimensional. They have greater access to digital tools, but that also means time moves very quickly for them and how they think. And as a result of that, the patience to sit and read long, deep, detailed informational texts may also be shorter. So if I use this very uh, mathematical looking grid of input, output, you know, remember doing functions and algebra, you know, input functions, output for those of you who like math literacy. Okay, well, <laughs> based on who they are, if learners' ages range between 18 and 40, then that means they, they require diverse instructional approaches. Okay, if learners are pursuing first and second careers, they require opportunities to build from what they know. And we talk about activating prior knowledge already in education, but if I've worked a whole second career already and I'm entering another one and I'm already 40 and I'm now coming back to, to increase my skills, there's a whole career world that I've already known, which means I have to be able to leverage prior knowledge. And that has to be considered valuable, right? And, and, and instructors to know how to use that prior knowledge to usher through that learning. Similarly, when we have learners with families, when we're talking about institutions and structures, there's a need for flexibility and compassion. How do we structure flexibility? How do we structure compassion? Many people would argue that compassion is a disposition. Well, yeah, compassion is a disposition, but when we structure flexibility, we provide opportunities for compassion to readily become more available. If learners are digitally uh, acculturated, then learning must be paired with digital tools. Jason, I think some of your work talks about this, right? 
Learners are not necessarily well-versed or confident with complex texts. Then what must we do? We still require direct and supportive instruction with reading. We, we can't get away from like, let's talk about how to scaffold reading, how to build our reading skills. If learners are multidimensional, then we must have fluid approaches to communication within standardization. Because, you know, unfortunately, and some people will say, fortunately, they're still going to take a licensure test. They're still going to take a certification exam. So they must be prepared and supported to do that, but there must be fluid approaches so that the critical thinking that Patricia Hill Collins talks about isn't dismissed. So engaging 21st century learners includes some things. Embracing the language and literacies they navigate in everyday life. Discourse practices within and among learners are complex and social. And these academic tools they have, they have to be able to move seamlessly and sometimes unbeknownst to them. They know how to code switch and move between these complexities without even thinking about it. Maybe we need to make these things visible so they become accessible tools for them. The demand for literacies, yes, that is plural. There's more than one way to be literate. Combined with the complexities for everyday life, require reading practices that equip students beyond rudimentary, rudimentary notions of literacy. Simultaneously, they too require that we not assume learners' chronological age means readiness, okay? As I would tell my seventh graders as they were changing and growing in life, and once we went off to high school, just because you are taller than me does not mean you are ready, right? Your chronology, the biology has to line up with the social and emotional, and we must be prepared to support that. So I know that our time is down to one minute, and I'd like to leave you with um, some closing thoughts. There are definitely other pieces in here. There was a little bit more from Fannie Lou and, and what happens when she finally speaks in front of the DNC in 1962, right? Um, that's important. I think these links I can make available to Jason and, and, and um, um, you can very much so go to YouTube. Um, that's not a promotional for YouTube. Um, <laughs> I'm not getting any kickback on that. But if you look at Fannie Lou Hamer's powerful testimony during Freedom Summer, um, she challenges this idea of what are you doing for community in the social politics? So someone who went from pig farming to sharecropping is now speaking in front of the DNC. So I wanna leave you with these words of what are our commitments to the learner? And I wanna challenge you for, with three. First, when we think about career and technical education, when we think about learners in general, we have to dismantle the stereotypes about who they are and their journey. Secondly, we must engage them as academic thinkers, okay? We have to disassociate this idea that career technical is over here and college is over here. And the academic thinkers are the ones who go to college in the very traditional sense and the, the worker bees are over here, right? Because if that's the case, Fannie Lou Hamer, the sharecropper, never would be in front of the DNC, right? <laughs> okay, so we, we have to dismantle that. And we have to create connectedness, okay? Community resources, relationships, a sense of accountability, okay? We need to build dialogue with students and their families and continually do needs assessments. We need to consider discussing familial contexts for access to learning. What is their schooling history, both formally and informally? We need to engage the topic of trust. What does this mean and what does this look like in action? Because every learner uh, comes with a different story and some learners are vulnerable. We need to examine communication style and ways of thinking. We need to be fully present. So here's my final thought. 
Any intellectual pursuit requires engagement with students and learning that reflects their lives, the times they exist, and the futures they seek to dream. We as educators are endowed with the privilege, not the right, to collaborate with students to understand how their experiences are opportunities to learn complex material. Without the study of them, material alongside youth, we remove ourselves from the existence of our futures. Thank you so much to this wonderful community for your leadership and engaging in this conversation. Um, I look forward to the, continuing the dialogue and discussing more of the hows. And I'll turn it back over to Jason. I know we are at time. If there's a question, thought, or comment, or something that the audience would like, so I'll turn it over to you. But thank you so much. And I look forward to furthering our work. Thank you so much, Dr. Brown. That was a very, very powerful presentation to wrap up the keynote portion of our summer speaker series. Um, if there are comments or questions, please do feel free to throw those in the chat. A couple of things. We will have the um, the keynotes available on YouTube later next week, and we will share that out in a variety of ways, including uh, the Illinois P20 Network newsletter that will go out on July 8th, as well as through the Illinois State Board of Education. And then we are gearing up to continue professional development. We'll be releasing uh, the full schedule, initial schedule, more will be added, but of professional learning events that include both individual events as well as um, a series of series uh, over the course of next year. And those will be coming out uh, next week as well. We're very excited. Uh, we're just putting together the publication version of that. So look for those as people return from vacations and start gearing up for the start of the 2022-2023 school year. And of course, uh, this, this series will continue later in July with our um, educator panels. And so thank you again to everybody for being here. Dr. Brown, thank you so very much. You're welcome. I want to give a shout out to Rodrigo, who quickly jumped in and saved me, was high on yes. the hog. <laughs> Phenomenal documentary. So, you know, as students are studying, if they're doing culinary arts, you know, invite them into think about culinary arts from the perspectives of the living and that travel. And I'm very excited about my, my trip to Ghana that is forthcoming, my previous trips to Ethiopia and Senegal and, and uh, Gambia, and thinking about how you think about language, culture, identity. And when you talk about a trade, you know, fabric and textiles in Africa mean something very different than fabric and textiles in India. And we have to embrace, if we're going to do the work, then, then we need to... Um, think about these borders that we've created to um, overcomplicate the work. I'll say that. <laughs> Thank you so awesome. much. Awesome. Thank you, everybody.